the Lord. I will never forget, I was getting ready to give a talk at a dinner where there was a large gathering of people and I was supposed to speak during the dinner and the master of ceremonies comes up to me and the people are still eating I think it was about the dessert time, and he looks at me and he says, Father, should we let the people enjoy themselves a little while longer, or should we have you speak? <laughs> this, of course, reminds me always of my grandmother, who lived with me for about six months on two different occasions when I was pastor in Crescent City. She stayed with me, and she would go to church, and she didn't understand English or Spanish, and she sat in the front row, and... At one point, I think it was the Mass in Spanish, and I was going on and on. I'm, I don't know if that ever happens here. Probably not. Uh, <laughs> and I was going on and on and on, and all of a sudden, I look at my grandmother, and she goes like this. But in the same church, uh, she would sit in the front pew, and one lady didn't say hello to her, which, if you know my grandmother, that's a big no-no, you know, not to, not to greet someone. And I saw I, she was she was so distressed, you know, after Mass. Now, remember, she doesn't speak English or Spanish, so she would come to church, and, uh, and nobody there spoke Polish. So there was no mutual language. And she was so distressed. She says, she didn't say hi to me. I, I wanted to greet her. And she didn't greet me back. And I said, well, you know, it's probably because you don't speak English and you don't speak Spanish and she doesn't speak Polish. And my grandmother looks at me and she says, but you don't have to speak in order to smile. You don't have to speak in order to smile. Love is a universal language that we can all speak. Lots of people are always interested to know how many languages I speak. Why does it matter? I could speak all the languages in the world, but if I do not speak the language of love, then, in the words of St. Paul, I am nothing, huh? an empty vessel. We can all speak the language of love through our gestures, through our kindness, through our welcome. Since I am allowed to speak about other parishes where I was stationed at, you know, later on I'll probably be telling stories from Clear Lake. <laughs> but for now, you're safe. <laughs> In one of the churches I was at, this young man would come to church 
And this was his first time. And he would wear a hat. And one of the regulars, you know, a lot of times you have to be kind of careful with the regulars because as people who come to church on a weekly basis, we can make it all about religion and forget about Jesus, forget about God who is love. Religion enslaves, God frees. The word religion is from the Latin, talking about languages, and I know a lot of them. Religion comes from the Latin religare, which means to bind. It enslaves you. God frees you. And we have a lot of religious slaves, not just in the Catholic Church, People who are very fanatical make it all about the rules and regulations where the rules and the regulations like for the scribes and the Pharisees are above people or the people who are the Bible trump, uh, trumping people, you know, they, they want to hit you over the head with your Bible, you know, and they, they quote the Bible at you. They may know the book but they don't know the author of the book because the author of the book is love. So we have to be very careful not to have religion be above people. The rules are made for people, not people for rules. The regulations, the commandments are made for people, not the people for the commandments and the regulations. And we always have to remember that when we treat one another with great acceptance, welcome, and understanding. To never reject anyone or add more rocks on people's shoulders, more burdens on people's shoulders, but to take away that's what faith should be doing, especially in a time of great distress and uncertainty and fear and depression and anxiety. Our faith should come to fill us with hope, not to burden us more. Remember, Jesus says, come to me, all of you who find life burdensome. Take my yoke upon you for my Yoke is easy and my burden is light. At the time of Jesus, rabbis all placed yokes on the shoulders of their disciples, their students. And Jesus says, I am the type of rabbi whose burden is light, whose yoke is easy. He doesn't burden us. He takes the burdens away with his love and understanding. And in that same parish, this young man would come and he had been in Afghanistan and he was shot in the head and, and other parts of his body as well. But there was a hole in his head and he would wear a hat to cover it. And somebody, I guess one of the regulars came up to him and said, Take your hat off. You can't be here with your hat on. And he came out of the church. And I met him as he was walking out. And he says, Father, I can't take my hat off. And he took it off and I saw it. That's what we do to each other. We hurt one another. We place burdens on each other. Today is a very special day, not just because it's Rejoice Sunday, but also because March 14th, those of you who are on my Facebook, you can check last year, the year before, and the previous year. March 14th is a very special day in my life because it is my grandma's birthday. So, she's celebrating right now with some very good 
homemade vodka. <laughs> it's warming her up. <laughs> so it's a very special day. And my grandmother and my grandfather were married for 44 years. And I lived with them when I was in Poland. And in a ceremony, a wedding ceremony in Poland, when you are married, the priest takes a cross off of the altar and says, Take it! To the husband. Take it. As he hands him the cross and says, Take it because from now on she's going to be your cross. And vice versa, he hands it to the wife and says, Take it because from now on he's going to be your cross. Who have been the crosses in your life? I'm speaking this morning and asking a question. Don't respond out loud. These are questions you respond to yourself. Who has caused you the most distress, pain, and suffering in your life? The people you love the most. They have been your crosses in your life. And yet, what would your life be without them Jesus says today, whoever wants to come after me will take up his cross and follow me. To take up our cross every day. My grandmother did that for 44 years of her life. She was married to my grandfather who was an alcoholic it, when he lived in Poland it was the time of communism and the government didn't provide much for the people but it did provide a plentiful supply of vodka plentiful so he became an alcoholic. He beat my grandmother. It was a very tough life, particularly because he joined the party, the Communist Party, which is an atheistic system where they proclaimed to the people and indoctrinated him that his work was his God, that God is dead, the church is your enemy, don't waste your time with faith. And every day my grandmother would pray the rosary and he would ridicule her. I remember that very well when he made fun of her as she would pray the rosary. And what did she do? She just remained quiet. When we would get ready to go to church on Sunday, he would get ready to go to work and he would say, work is my prayer. And what did my grandmother do? Did she beat him over the head with a Bible as so many people want to do today? Here, here's this leaflet, right? You know, read this or repeat these words after me. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior and accept him in your heart and then boom! You'll be fine. Is that what she did? No. She prayed for him. Quietly. Because notice, 
we are to be about announcing the good news. It doesn't say good advice. Is it good news or good advice? So why are you so intent on giving advice all the time? Especially to your children. The best advice you can give them is your example. How many people talk to their children about God and their kids are not interested in hearing it? Talk less to your children about God and more to God about your children or you think you're more powerful than God. Something you're going to say is going to move their heart. If God can move mountains, don't you think he can move a little human heart? Or have we stopped believing and trusting that it's God who converts, not us? That's the second reading today. It's grace. We are saved by grace. Grace finds us, and it is a gift. It's not we who find God. It's God who finds us. God is after us, all of us, and God is after your family members, your children. God is after them. Where sin abounds, their grace abounds even more. The more we get away from God, the more God is after us. The more sin-filled lives someone leads, the more sinful their life. The more God is there trying to get them. As God was after my grandfather. For 44 years, my grandmother prayed for him. Enduring ridicule and all sorts of abuses. that she put up with, patiently trusting that God would work. And God does. In God's time, not in your time. How many of you have been praying for something for 44 years? What should you continue to do? Pray! Maybe another 44 years. Because you're in this time, which is Kronos time. God is in his time, which is Kairos time. There are no calendars. There is no turning forward the clock in God's time. And God responds to each and every prayer and supplication God hears each and every prayer and answers us. The Bible makes that very clear. There's no prayer that is not answered by God. So you continue knocking and the door will be opened. You continue to seek and you will find. And you continue to ask. And you will receive. That is the promise that the Bible makes. Or is God a liar? I'm asking a question. Is God a liar? Does God lie? You got to ask yourself that. You know, am I here or listening right now? And if I think that God is not going to take care of this or this or that issue or this or that suffering, or this or that problem, that God is not going to make sure that my children are okay, then I believe in a God who is a liar because he says that every hair on our head is counted. So important are we that everything will be okay, that all will be well. My favorite saint, Julian of Norwich, in her Revelations of Divine Love, God reveals to her and says, 
at the end, all will be well. I'm asking a question right now. Does it, did Jesus tell her in the middle, all will be well? Like right now, we're in the middle of the pandemic. No, things happen. People are dying. There is all sorts of suffering. That's in the middle. But at the end, all will be well. And all will be well with your kids. And in your marriage. And with your health. And in your house. All will be well. At the end. Because God is in charge. And he won't let anything bad happen to you or to your loved ones. Look at my grandfather. 44 years, my grandmother praying for him. And what happened? He got diagnosed with colon cancer. And in eight months, he died. God uses all sorts of crises in our life, doesn't he? You know, and in eight months he died of the colon cancer. <clears throat> and after the doctors told him that he had stage four colon cancer, he came home. This was a Tuesday, and the following Sunday, I walk in to the kitchen, and there he is all dressed up. And I look at him and I say, what are you all dressed up for? And he says, I'm going to church with you today. And I was going to make more comments, but at that my grandmother enters the kitchen, grabs me like that, pulls me out and says, shh, let's just go along with it. She never said anything. And he went to church with us and continued to go as long as he could and then asked to go to confession because he was baptized and received his first Holy Communion and confirmation before the communists took over Poland. My grandparents were born before the Second World War. He made his confession to the priest and the whole town, my whole town in Poland knows this story, to the same priest that my grandfather threatened to kill. Mm -hmm. He went to confession to that same priest. The same priest anointed him forgave him his sins, and gave him something that no communist manifesto, no atheistic ideology could give him, which is what? Hope. That he didn't die, but he just changed places. He went from an earthly existence to an eternal existence. Went from this life to eternal life. That I did not say goodbye to him, neither did my grandmother, but we just said, see you later. Because that's what faith tells us. That we don't say goodbye to our loved ones. That we say, see you later. My grandfather, through the fruits of the prayers of my grandmother, 44 years of praying and hoping, came back to himself and to the faith. And now I believe that he is having the time of his life in heaven. Because that's the God I believe in, you know. The God that the second reading says today is rich in mercy. Not rich in condemnation. His religious people would look at my grandfather's life and would say, oh, no. Mm -mm. You know, he's probably somewhere in purgatory. Huh? Right? But I know. 
that he's in heaven because I believe in a God in, rich in mercy. And I believe in the God that the Bible today says to us, so loved the world so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Not to condemn, but to save. God doesn't condemn. We condemn ourselves and we condemn each other through the way we treat one another our horrible words. I always love to call my grandmother and to hear her uplifting words the way that she greets me always. There's really no translation in English because there's such flowery words. You know, oh, my love, it's just so wonderful to hear you, you know. Which is why I'm always so like that as well, you know, because I learned that. I, I always try to give everybody my grandmother's faith, you know, not some theological treatises or anything like that, but a simple faith. And I want to leave you all this morning to call you to do the same thing in your own life. To bless. The word blessing, what does it mean? In Latin, benedicere or benedicat means bene. Can you hear that? Good, bien. All of you Spanish scholars here, you know, we're in California. Spanish is all around us. Bene, bien, good, dicere, words, right? Words, good words. How do you bless? With good words, uplifting words. That's why the Bible says, say only the good things men need to hear. So when you insult people, make fun of people, gossip, when you bring people down, you are cursing them. Maldicere. And there's so much cursing going around, isn't there? All around us. Huh? So many people cursing one another. Bless each other. Lift each other up with your kind and good words. As I continue to bless each of you, not just this Rejoice Sunday, but every Sunday as we celebrate the great gift of our faith and my grandmother's birthday and I won't tell you which birthday because she wouldn't like that <laughs> as we stand and profess our faith this morning I believe in one God Father Almighty